first on our list is, oh, I can't read that. Looks like a doctor's signature to me. <laughs> well, that's why Just I saying. can't read it. Oh. Guilty as charged. Um, <coughs> Dr. Dan Stock, um, to, to address your comment, gee, it's hard to believe we're 18 months into this and still having a problem, and I would suggest the reason we still have a problem is because we're doing things that are not useful, and we're getting our sources of information from the Anna State Board of Health and the CDC, who actually don't bother to read science before they do this. Um, I'm actually a functional family medicine physician. That means I am specially trained in immunology and inflammation regulation, and everything being recommended by the CDC and the State Board of Health is actually contrary to all the rules of science. So things you should know about coronavirus and all other respiratory viruses, they are spread by aerosol particles, which are small enough to go through every mask. By the way, the literature that supports all of that is in a flash drive that we presented to you. It's been given to the secretary. As a matter of fact, it quotes at least three studies <laughs> so, that, sponsored by the NIH to that exact fact, even though the CDC and the NIH have chosen to, to ignore the very science that they paid to have done. Um, that is why you keep struggling with this, is because you cannot make these viruses go away. The natural history of all respiratory viruses is that they circulate all year long, waiting for the immune system to get sick through the winter or become deranged, as has happened recently with these vaccines, and then they cause symptomatic disease. Because they cannot be filtered out and they have animal reservoirs, and this is a very important point, no one can make this virus go away. The CDC has managed to convince everybody that we can handle this like we did smallpox, where we could make a virus go away. Smallpox had no animal reservoirs. The only thing it learned to infect was humans. That's why we were able to make that virus go away. That will not happen with this any more than it will with influenza, the common cold, respiratory syncytial virus, adenoviral respiratory syndromes, or anything else that has animal reservoirs. So the reason you can't do this is because you're trying to do something which has already been tried and can't be done. Equally important is that vaccination changes none of this, especially with this vaccine. And I would hope this board would start asking itself, before it considers taking the advice of the CDC, the NIH, and the State Board of Health, why we are doing things about this that we didn't do for the common cold, influenza, or respiratory syncytial virus. And then ask yourself, why is a vaccine that is supposedly so effective having a breakout in the middle of the summer when respiratory viral syndromes don't do that? And to help you understand that, you need to know the condition that is called antibody-mediated viral enhancement. That is a condition done when vaccines work wrong, as they did in every coronavirus study done in animals on coronaviruses after the SARS uh, outbreak and done in respiratory syncytial virus, where a vaccine used in a vulnerable individual done the wrong way, which why cannot be done right for a respiratory virus, which has a very low pathogenicity rate, causes the immune system to actually fight the virus wrong and let the virus become worse than it would with native infection. And that is why you are seeing an outbreak right now. In fact, in that flash drive you're going to have coming to you and in the emails with six extra, will be a study showing that 75 percent of people who had COVID-19 positive symptom cases in Barnstable, Massachusetts outbreak were fully vaccinated. Therefore, there is no reason for treating any person vaccinated any differently than any person unvaccinated. You should also know that no vaccine, even the ones I support and would give to myself and my children, ever stops infection. In 2014, there was outbreak of mumps in the National Hockey League. The only people who came down the symptoms were the people who were unvaccinated or unknown vaccine status. Boy, that sounds like a great argument for vaccines. But a question that you should ask yourself, knowing that half of the people who came down with symptomatic disease had no contact with an unvaccinated or unknown vaccine status individual, where did they get the disease? And the answer was from the vaccinated individuals. No vaccine prevents you from getting infection. You get infected, you shed pathogen. This is especially true of viral respiratory pathogens. You just don't get symptomatic from it. So you cannot stop spread. You cannot make these numbers that you've planned on get better by doing any of the things you're doing because that is the nature of viral respiratory pathogens. And you can't prevent it with a vaccine because they don't do the very thing you're wanting them to do. And you will be chasing this the remainder of your life until you recognize that the Center for Disease Control and the Indiana State Board of Health are giving you very bad scientific guidance. And instead, read the articles that are going to come on the email and are on this flash drive and listen to the people in this audience here tonight who actually have recognized the advice they are getting from the CDC and the NIH is counterfactual. 
And that's why you're still fighting this with this vaccine that supposedly was going to make all of this go away, but has suddenly managed to make an outbreak of COVID-19 develop in the middle of the summer when vitamin D levels are at their highest. By the way, the other thing that would be necessary any vaccine restriction to be considered is if there were no other treatment available. And I can tell you, having treated over 15 COVID-19 patients, that between active loading with vitamin D, ivermectin, and zinc, that there is not a single person who has come anywhere near the hospital. And we already have studies that show that if you achieve a 25-hydroxy vitamin D level greater than 55, your risk of COVID-19 death will drop down to through one quarter of the population average for the United States. And there are active treatment trials included on that flash drive that show the same is true. So if you were going to discriminate based upon vaccine, you should also discriminate based upon 25-hydroxy vitamin D level, zinc taste test response, and probably previous infections, since there are also studies on that flash drive that show that people who have recovered from COVID-19 infection actually get no benefit from vaccination at all, no reduction in symptoms, no reduction in hospitalization, and suffer two to four times the rate of side effects if they are subsequently vaccinated. Therefore, the policies that you are basing on are totally counterfactual. I don't blame this board for that because I know you aren't scientists and you've thought it was reasonable to listen to the CDC, NIH, and the Indiana State Board of Health. But I would encourage that instead you listen to the people out here in this audience and read what's on that data drive. And if anybody here in this board has any questions about anything on that, I will happily come back and sit with you individually if you would like to explain the science behind this. And if you're worried about being sued by somebody because you don't follow the guidance of the CDC and the NIH, I will tell you have a free pro bono expert testimony at your disposal. I will testify in defense of this board, turning down all these recommendations for free at any time in any court. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is signed up is um, Haley Long, Lang Loring. Sorry, I couldn't read that one. Amber spoke a pitching concert when I opened the school. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I feel we have a problem within the school corporation when the administration, administration deems it appropriate for any reason whatsoever to force my child out of school for 10 days without providing adequate academics. This is a publicly funded school. We pay for academics. The community as a whole has cooperated during the pandemic with every change in rule, learning, distancing, masking, shielding, and allowed time for science to prove itself on this virus, and it has. According to the CDC in the state of Indiana between 2020 and 2021, which is updated daily on the website, there have been zero deaths reported in children from infants to 17 years old. Kids are not dying. Kids are least likely to be affected by the virus with scientific data and reported cases submitted to the health department to prove this. The school staff can absolutely make that choice to mask and vaccinate themselves if they feel unsafe at work. But our children do not have a choice or a voice. It is our job as parents to make sure our kids are being given the educational opportunities they deserve and this corporation's job to provide those resources for our kids, not only because it's morally right, but because we are paying you to do just that. Taking money for services and then not providing them is theft, plain and simple. I will not continue to pay for a corporation for unprovided services if this problem cannot be resolved. Allowing vaccinated children to continue their education over those who are not vaccinated makes no sense when the vaccine is still in clinical trials and the majority of children are not even age eligible and has been proven that vaccinated kids can still transmit the virus. We are not animals and for a school that prides themselves on social emotional development as much as Mount Vernon does, shouldn't we be aware of the long-term social emotional consequences of masking and quarantining is going to cause? These are children who need to come and meet friends, not masks, who are learning to read and write, who need to hear their teachers clearly and not through a muffled cloth, who need to learn to be confident and not walk around in fear of something that acts nothing more than a common cold would to them. I am not a doctor, but I do know how to read a chart. It is time for the school corporation to start really noticing these constantly inconsistent social distancing guidelines and the effects that they have on our kids' educational opportunities. A solution would be to stick up for our children, be brave, and allow them to come to school free to walk and breathe and learn without fear and complete restrictive control over something that you cannot ultimately control. There have been viruses for thousands of years. They evolve, they come, they go. After this is going to be another one. We live in a world full of bacterial and living cells. Stick up for the community, 
say no to the political propaganda and the fear that the crooked government and the media are trying to shove in our faces every day with threats, defamation, slander, and dirty financial incentives to manipulate their way onto those who use freedom to say no to smothering our kids in a cloth and forcing medical choices. And I also would like to know how you're going to enforce six feet distancing, even if my kid does come back with a negative test, put a mask on him, and then still support their social emotional abilities in school. At five years old, he just started kindergarten that's all thank you thank you our next uh, speaker that has signed up is Amanda Steele my son is a second grader this year at Mount Comfort Elementary <clears throat> I don't have any packets with me anything like that um, but I work in health care <clears throat> 17 years I've been working in putting so much into my career and this past year has just made me so sick of what healthcare has turned into. I'm exhausted. Everyone that I work with is exhausted. Hospitals are short. It's not just nurses. Everywhere. You got the pharmacy staff working, you know, 16 hour days, three, four days in a row. When COVID started, we had to reuse our masks for a week, put them in a paper bag, take them off our face, put them in a paper bag, come in the next day and reuse it. When we are, were around COVID patients, we were there giving them the care that they needed. This virus is just so political now. It, makes me so sick that I'm even involved in healthcare. It has made so many people doubt everyone who has anything to say about it. Was that really important on your phone? Are, are you paying attention to me? I was um, restarting the timer because it accidentally turned off. Okay, just, just making sure, you know, cause I'm here not only speak about my son, but everyone else's children here. Nobody believes it when they're like, oh, you put a mask on. It doesn't affect your breathing. It does. I've wore a mask for 17 years in healthcare, preparing IV medications and everything for patients coming in and out. There are side effects to it, long term. You get headaches, tired, drained. Putting masks on these kids, especially when the rate is so low for them to even contract it. Does anybody care about the flu anymore? Is the flu not a thing? Speaking of the flu, the PCR test can't even distinguish COVID between the flu. So how can you expect these kids, oh, you were 15 minutes, you were next to this other, other kid who's maybe positive for COVID. They don't really know because the tests are not accurate. They've never been accurate. I don't have faith in any of these tests. My son will not take any of these tests. And if that means pulling him out of the school system, then that's what I'll have to do because it's absolutely ridiculous. All of the politics that are surrounding this. And it's not just the politics. You know, you got these government corporations giving these schools money, well, we'll pull it away. If you don't do what we're telling you to do, if you don't do these mandates, if you don't do these recommendations that we're saying, then we just won't give you money. And I know it happens. I work in clinical research. I see how studies are supposed to go. I see what patients are supposed to receive when they're getting a research medication. When you get a research medication, you're supposed to get labs, follow up, make sure everything is okay in your body. Do you think that they're out there testing all of these millions of people are, who are getting this vaccine? They're not. There is also a PCR test that was pulled, a class one removal because 77,000 people got the test and it caused death. Not just death, but serious infections. And these are the tests that you're expecting parents to have faith in, that their kids are gonna get it. Not only do we, are we unsure about the vaccines, we're also unsure about these tests. And it's absolutely ridiculous that you wanna put masks on the kids to where they're struggling to breathe, they're having issues, and I'm tired of it, I'm sick of it. I know everyone here is sick of it. And I hope when you lay your head down at night, you know that you are making the best choice for every single kid. I coached my son's baseball team this summer. 
we had a COVID positive kid on the team. They were gonna pull us from the tournament because one child on my team had COVID. But I fought for all of those kids on that team because it was unfair. Contact tracing, what about the, the siblings of the kids on my team? They weren't pulled. Their sisters got to play softball, but yet the boy on my team couldn't go to his game because one of his teammates had COVID. So if you want to get technical about all of the COVID tracing, it's a lot more than just being with someone for 15 minutes in a room, close contact. It's far much more than that. And anybody with any ounce of brain cells in their head would understand what is going on does not make sense at all. And I'll leave that because I'm pretty sure I'm out of time. Thank you. <laughs> Janet Smith. Anyway, they provide guidance. However, during the past one and a half years, their guidance has been anything but consistent. In fact, the information coming from the CDC changes more frequently than a baby's diapers. The current so-called surge that we have is still only one third of what it was at its peak, and the deaths, as tragic as they are, remain flat. Even though the Delta variant is more contagious, it is less deadly, and much research has shown that children, if they get it have no under, and have no underlying conditions, have a 99.99 .99 rate of recovery, but the fear-mongering continues. However, there were 58,000 scientists and doctors who signed the Declaration of Barrington who disagreed with the CDC as well. Alabama recently refused to pass a law requiring masks, but gave parents the choice. If they want their children to wear masks, they are allowed to, but if not, they are not required. And as been said here, Governor Holcomb has not issued a mandate, but he's given you the option to choose what to do for your district. Hopefully those elected by the public will listen to the public. Parents of children should be able to choose if children wear masks or not. The majority of emails that you have received from parents has been in favor of no mask requirement. So does this board and administration want to listen to those who are involved and who elected them or to some CD guide, CDC guidance that will likely change tomorrow? And by the way, <clears throat> by the way, the FDA is pulling some of those PCR tests off the market because of the false positives they're, they're giving. We hope this board of administration believe that it should be government by the people, for the people, and of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, next is Tracy Dayhoff. Yeah. Um, what I'd like to talk about today are two different topics. The first one being our virtual learning plan while our kids are out on quarantine, and then our second one being antibody testing. So our current virtual learning plan is absolutely nothing. If your kid is quarantined, which my, two of mine were on day three of school, um, you're pretty much out of school. You're counted absent. Every day, teachers are allowed to post assignments to Google Classroom or Canvas if they choose. They don't have to. They're not actually getting instruction, but they might be getting some busy work. And I will say that I emailed every single teacher and still have not heard back from some of the teachers on what my child is going to do while they're out. Now, last year, my third grader was quarantined three different times, never so much as had a cold, mind you, but he was out over 30 days of school. At least last year, he was given the option to switch to virtual learning, which was subpar, but better than nothing. This year, if he's out 30 days, he's out 30 days. What, watching YouTube, maybe some Netflix? Um, it's not appropriate. As a parent, if I choose not to skin, send my kid to school, for 10 days, you can turn me into DCS for neglect, but we're allowing our medical <laughs> we're allowing our school system to neglect our children's education for God knows how many days and call it excused in the name of COVID. To me, there's no excuse for that. There needs to be some sort of better plan. Now, how could we potentially quarantine less students? I think that we could look at antibody testing. So currently, vaccinated students don't have to quarantine, don't have to contact trace, because we are assuming they have antibodies. We're not assuming that children that have COVID more than 90 days ago potentially still have antibodies. I personally still have antibodies to chickenpox, and I had it as a kindergartner. 
There's no long-term studies on COVID, so we don't know, but there is antibody testing. So if a child is contact traced, we should have the ability to check and see if they still have antibodies. And if they do, that's one less student we have to quarantine, and that's one less student receiving a subpar education. So I know you guys have the best interest of our kids at heart. I really do. I'm a pediatric pulmonary nurse. I just left work and came here. Um, we all care about the kids, whether we're nurses or parents or school board members or superintendents. And I just would hope that our school board would look at our current plans, come up with a better education plan so our kids are out on contact tracing. My child is trying to do physics with no instruction. He's a 15 year old, that's not acceptable. Um, and just look at how we could quarantine less. Right, I know that we're following CDC guidelines, whether we agree with them or not, you guys are doing your best job, but I do think that we have some options that could potentially improve this. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, next, Brooke Jones. Good afternoon, members of the board. First, I want to introduce myself. My name is Brooke Jones. I have three kids in the school. Um, I have a freshman at the high school, a seventh grader at the middle school, and a second grader at McCordsville Elementary. So one in every building. And two of the older two play sports, so we're here a lot. <laughs> um, I love the Mount Vernon community. I served three years on the MES PTO, two of which were vice president and presidencies. Um, I've also helped the last two years at the, for the MVEF gala, and um, it was on the committee for the silent auction. Recently, I watched the video of the custodians and the IAs that was put out, and every single one of them said why they love their job, because it feels like family. Their coworkers feel like family. I feel the same way about our school and our community. My kids tell me I know way too many people. Every time I step foot into the school, especially at McCordsville, I really do feel at home. I have developed some deep friendships with a lot of staff there, and it really does feel like family. I have gotten the opportunity to meet a few of you, and I truly do believe you want what is best for our kids. I know your job is not easy, and I appreciate everything you do, truly. Dr. Parker, I have always appreciated how you reach out in, within the community with the traveling talks and the virtual talks during COVID and how you involve the community. I also appreciate how you listen to different perspectives. But right now, more than ever, the parents are the one that need to raise up their voices and their concerns and who you need to listen to. Right now, we want to be heard, and I feel like you are truly listening and taking our concerns to heart. At the end of last year, when my kids got home from school and ripped those masks off their beautiful faces, I told them, we're never doing this again. No more masks. I will fight to the death for, e for each of you to breathe fresh air. This, that's what I'm doing today. I'm keeping my promise to my kids to advocate for their rights and freedoms. My fear is, just like we have seen with our country, how quickly we've seen division. That's my fear. We are not standing up to these ridiculous policies and are not standing up for our freedoms being taken away. I am a very involved mom and I know what is best for my children and I know how to keep my child safe, not anyone else, only me. If you cannot stand up now to mask and contact tracing, what will be next? When will this end? It won't. We all know there is more coming our way. We hear our hands are tied. There's nothing we can do about certain things. If we look at the DOE website, there are 287 schools in Indiana that do not do contact tracing. 287, and they're still open. I have a few emails here that I would like to read. <laughs> One is from the exec executive um, assistant to the Secretary of Education at the Indiana Health Department, and the other is from President um, John Jessup, the Hancock County Commissioner. So this is the email that I sent to the um, Department of Education. I just have a quick question about policies concerning contact tracing and wearing masks. Is there a law in Indiana that says schools must contact trace for COVID? Does the Department of Education have any law requirement in mandating masks in school? Good morning. Indiana is following CDC recommendations, which you can find below. School districts can set their own policies, so please contact your school district for specific questions related to their policies. For, or, for more information about contact tracing, you will need to contact the Indiana Department of Health. They, the Indiana Department of Health Education does not set health-related policies. Um, and then the other email is from the Hancock County Commissioner, and I asked the exact same question. And he said, hi, Brooke, thanks for your email. There is no direction on this from the county. The State Board of Health has issued guidance to the schools based on CDC guidance, sending you a screenshot of the most relevant info I can find on the matter. I highlighted what I believe is the issue, not a straightforward law saying that you must do this or that, but an intimidation in a way, 
a kind of do it or else kind of thing. I hope this is helpful. Keep fighting. These asinine directives are causing direct harm to our children. <laughs> so I ask, why do you say our hands are tied? Let's stop hiding behind these other organizations. Are we going to be brave and stand against these policies? Because if so, I and a lot of parents will be behind you 100%. Or are you going to give in to this fear, this fear of intimidation? Thanks for your time. Thank you, Brooke. Um, next is Kelly Leonard. I am here today um, a little unprepared. This is my first time doing this, and I think that the doctor pretty much blew me away when he first started talking. So um, I came here today. I was at the last July meeting. And there was a couple things said at the meeting that I wanted to fact check because I 100% didn't believe. One of those was being that 80% of Hancock County residents was fully vaccinated. I do not, I want to make it clear, I do not believe the CDC, they're all over the place. But I got all of my resources from the CDC to see what they said about it. And the CDC came back with 54.7% and that was um, Hancock County residents that were fully vaccinated. So I don't know your source of the statistic, I know mine, but they're both incorrect, so who do we believe? Another thing that you guys talked about was 75% of K through 12 took PCR tests at the end of the year. Um, I wanna know how that was possible because the nurse that told us about that said that it was at the very end of the year with like two weeks left and they just wanted the students to be able to be able to partake in the end of the school year activities if you had 75 percent of k through 12 pcr tests at the end of the year how is that possible you can get that many tests in two weeks so that was another question that i had about that that i would like to get answers on at some point um, I personally believe that if you are adding PCR testing within the school, you are opening a floodgate to lose the control that you have over medical testing procedures, advice, any kind of things with a school versus a doctor. If my kid's sick, I go to the doctor's office. I don't go to a school. Plain and simple, I think that you're giving the faculty in the school way too much permission and allowance to do things on a medical term, and I disagree with being able to have any sort of testing within the school. Um, I looked up a bunch of things on the CDC about how much since starting of March 2020, the CDC has bounced around. We've talked about three feet, we've talked about six feet, we've talked about masks don't work, we've talked about only N95 mask work, or now grandma can sew us a mask and it'll work. At the end of the day, the CDC is all over the place. So why are we still listening to the CDC? It is known fact, they're all over the place. They don't know what's going on. So I don't think that we need to be listening to the CDC. In fact, I think you need to be listening to the parents because if you modeled a school listening to the parents, every parent in the state of Indiana would wanna attend this school because nobody is listening to the parents at any of the schools about this COVID-19 that's going on. So I 100% think that if you wanna have an outstanding school that every parent around here wants their kid to go to, you should start listening to the parents, taking the time to answer emails, phone calls, and meeting with parents like you have tonight. Um, a couple more things that I wanted to bring up that were mentioned tonight. It was stated that it would take a couple more hours to get the actual data of daily COVID cases from last year. I highly encourage you to know that our kids are worth a couple more hours of work. And I would like that to happen. I would like to know those statistics. I also have known of an actual person right now that knows my daughter that has been contact traced to another student that was contact traced to a positive COVID case. I spoke with the mother about it. That's what I was told by the parent of the person that is under quarantine. And I would like to know how far back are we going with the contact tracing? Because that's not what I was told. Um, my daughter is highly involved into the sports and it's extremely disheartening to hear that because she's not vaccinated, she's gonna miss out on the ability that she's waited two years to play this sport 
finally at the age group that she's in, and she might miss out on some practices and some games, all because she's not vaccinated, all because she might be quarantined. That's gonna shatter her. She waited two years to play this sport, and it's gonna shatter my kid. So I don't need to pull my kid from your school if you take away her sports. She's willing to leave. That's all I really have. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Cindy Cobb. So I've talked to a handful of you already this week. My family, you know, <laughs> we're directly affected by the quarantine this week. <laughs> My child has been home with zero instruction. Zero, nothing. That is not fair. He's being discriminated against. I stood before a public platform last week and praised this entire district because I believe in the district looked like a fool because I said I support everything you do then I get a call to Monday not from the school to get my kid from my own child that said in quarantine for nearly two hours at the building two hours no one thought they should reach back out to myself my husband or the six other people on the contact list two hours a long time for a 12 year old and by the way he ate his lunch in my car at 1 30 because he didn't get to eat lunch it happened the process broke it failed it might have worked last year to my understanding it did it didn't work this year we can talk about not having our core team in place when it happened i get it but as a district <laughs> We have to be prepared. Have a backup plan to your backup plan. Because if you're that chaotic over a quarantine case, you can't. And to top it off, I walked in the school. Nobody asked me to identify myself. No one asked me for my ID, nor did they ask me to sign my child out. I walked out of one of your buildings with, with my child. Nobody, he wasn't accounted for. That's confirmed because the school nurse called me and said, Mrs. Cobb, your child's been contact traced. Come get him. He's in my car. <laughs> so you have no idea where my child is. Wow. You have no idea. So God forbid you have to do a head count, you're one short, and you're one short on my child. Like, it's not acceptable, appropriate, and I we can't tolerate that as parents like that's my child like in any it could happen to anybody chaos or not you're charged with having control over a crisis situation there's no control so then i go on to find out that there's no educational plan put in place i was and am still shocked about that because like many others here tonight have said our tax dollars go towards paying our child's education. Two of my child's teachers have reached out. The others, no. In fact, they're counting his work as zeros. Again, like that's not appropriate, and I won't tolerate that at the end of the day. We have to stop quarantining our kids because their education is so important. Like, we have to educate them. My child's 12. This has been hard, like mentally. And my kid's the lucky one. He has a parent that love him. He has a great home. I'm there with him to check in on him every day. But what about all those other 73 students that you contact trace? How many of those kids aren't that lucky? We need to really think about their mental health. I think that's going to be something we really need to look at for these kids. Like, that's a worry to me. A great leader once said to me, when the world is at its worst, we're at our best. I want nothing more than for Mount Vernon to say, when the world's at its worst, we're at our best. 
let us use the events that's happened this last week. Let us pave a good pathway for a change. And if it means that every person in this room will stand behind you for that change, I'm certain that they will. It is that important to us. Mount Vernon is better than this, and our kids deserve so much better. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Philip Coleman. Uh, I thought the doctor was pretty powerful, but I can't follow that. <laughs> that's, that's emotional. I mean, I'm 41 years old, big bearded guy, and I want to cry. That's ridiculous. I'm sorry. Um, I don't want to speak against masks. I didn't plan on speaking tonight, but here I am. I don't want to speak against contact tracing, but I'm asking the same thing. I don't understand why we spend hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars a year in technology, and then we're going to kick kids out of school against their will with no resource to learn other than here's maybe a packet that a teacher might have or might not have sent home for them to self-guide on with no other assistance. And then you can play catch up when you return. There is no catch up with kids. Kids don't catch up. I don't catch up. Most of us don't. Um, you know, contact tracing last year, we talked on the phone, Dr. Parker, and I appreciate it. We, for like an hour last year, it was a great phone call. What I learned was over 1,400 kids had been contact traced, but of that number, not a single child who was forcibly removed from school tested positive for COVID at a later date. That's a pretty powerful statistic. That's pretty powerful. Not one kid. You know, I grew up, times have changed. We talk about no kid left behind, but that's what we're doing. We're leaving kids behind without resources. You know, um, I'm gonna brag for a second. My kid's a straight A student. She's been on your list two years running. Spelling Bee champion, two years. She works her butt off to get that. It doesn't come easy, I promise you. As a family, we spend an hour, two hours, three hours every night, you know, helping her, working with her. Uh, but I promise it's a fight. And you've made our fight even harder by not giving us the resources to help fight that fight. Um, I just said, we, we got to do better than that. You know, I know teachers are overworked. I think everybody would agree with that. And they all do an amazing job. Um, but, you know, my family, we own a machine shop. And when, I, and when I get an extra job in, I don't just get to say it's too much. I can't do it. You know, right now we're in a crappy situation and there's extra work that needs to be done. And if a teacher has to spend an extra 30 minutes or an hour a day putting a lesson plan online, welcome to being a salaried employee. <laughs> I, I, and that's, that's a tough pill to swallow. I hate it as much as the next guy. I want to get home and spend time with my family. But if I choose to just not do my job, my business fails, my family fails, and here we are. So I would really implore that you, you gotta reach down deep, buckle up, and, and, and get back to offering a virtual option when a kid gets contact traced. You have to, there's, we, we just, there's, no, there's, there's not an option there, we have to. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was our last um, speaker who has signed in to speak.